Well, first for uh, giving me uh, the opportunity to make this talk. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to uh, present some studies about the, the uh, epoch of realization and about uh, its evolving topology. Uh, so firstly, I'm going to uh, say a few words because it has already been said, but uh, the epoch of realization happened a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Uh, when the cast of the universe was cold and neutral and the first uh, galaxies, the first objects uh, were created. Uh, and while uh, evolving, the galaxy uh, emitted the UV radiation that ionized the gas around them to, first, to form these uh, ionized uh, bubbles. And these bubbles grow and uh, at the end of the epoch of ionization percolate in the universe to give us the universe we know today with its totally uh, ionized gas. Um, so this epoch is uh, a lot uh, observed nowadays with uh, different kind of indirect observations, for example, with Lyman Alpha, uh, uh, which can probe the distribution of hydrogen uh, clouds uh, during this epoch. We can also directly see uh, some galaxies during this epoch with uh, the Hubble telescope and nowadays with the James Webb telescope. Uh, we can also probe the, uh, for example, optical depth with uh, the CMB power spectrum. Uh, what I'm more interested in this talk is uh, what we will uh, have with SKA. Uh, it will uh, probe the neutral um, hydrogen gas during the epoch of ionization, thanks to the emission uh, within the, um, due to the hydrogen, uh, neutral hydrogen, that uh, release this 21 centimeter signal. Uh, so this signal is interesting because uh, it depends uh, on a lot of things. It depends on the uh, neutral uh, hydrogen fraction uh, and also on the distribution of, um, on the, sorry, on the density of baryons and uh, also on a function of the temperature. Um, so this signal will be probed uh, as, uh, at many frequencies, at many redshifts. And I'm showing you examples of uh, what we will have. Um, so it's a simulated, uh, these are simulated maps with 21 cm fast. And uh, here is the beginning of uh, the epoch of ionization. And if you go over there, uh, you reach the end of ionization. What you can particularly see is these white bubbles that grow, um, that grow and grow until it's all white, uh, meaning that uh, the gas is uh, totally reionized. So within these uh, maps, we have a lot of information. Um, so why studying this, this epoch? Well, it's because uh, that's when the first uh, structures have emerged. Uh, so we can study the, the galaxy formation, uh, evolution, properties, thanks to this epoch. And also there is a strong link with uh, the cosmic web. Uh, but uh, what I want to talk about more, more is the, the, the understanding of the global evolution of this process. Uh, for example, uh, the timing of reionization is not well constrained. Uh, we also wonder uh, if the, the reionization was uniform everywhere for all the galaxies, and uh, also uh, what is the evolution of the ionized and neutral bubbles. Um, so yeah, my aim is to answer the question, how does the reionization happen? Uh, and I'm studying the growth of structures, the ionized uh, and neutral bubbles, their geometry, evolution, distribution, the percolation and also uh, the global evolution of the process. So this has already been done uh, a lot in the literature. People have studied the size of uh, neutral and ionized bubbles. Um, they have studied the, the spatial structures with uh, 21 centimeter spectra. Uh, they have also count uh, 3D structures like peak tunnels and voids, uh, and also the geometry of bubble and percolation. So I'm proposing something a bit different. Uh, well, it's a study of uh, this uh, simulated map, the reionization times map. Um, in which, um, which contains uh, the time at which uh, the gas has reionized uh, at each position. So the blue regions uh, are the first uh, regions to reionize and the red one are the last one to reionize. So it contains uh, a lot of uh, spatial and temporal information about the reionization process. And what's also interesting is that it resumes all of uh, the information you can find in, in a, for example, a series of binary um, uh, ionized gas fractions. Uh, in only uh, one map. So this map uh, comes from simulation, as I said. Uh, so it can come from uh, cosmological simulations, IMA, for example, and uh, 21 cm fast simulations. So uh, in the studies I will uh, mention here, I'm uh, staying at large scale, so higher than uh, 100 megaparsec over H with a resolution of one megaparsec over H uh, to get close to the resolution that we will have with SKA. So in this map, uh, there is a lot of uh, physical information. 
if you are interested at the uh, first places that we ionize, the sources of ionization or, or the so-called reionization seed, you can look at the minima. If you are, um, uh, all of the points that are connected to uh, the minima uh, with the negative gradients uh, form what we call the reionization patches. In these patches, uh, there is the uh, information about the extension of uh, the radiative influence of the sources. Uh, okay. Uh, it's the reionization times. Sorry? Uh, yeah, it's uh, normalized. Um, so yeah, the edge of these patches is called the skeleton, and it has information about the percolation lines between uh, the ionization fronts. Uh, you can also measure the, uh, trace the isocontours of this map, which are uh, regions that are reached by uh, deionization fronts at the same time, and which has information about the size evolution of bubbles. And if you derive this map, uh, you have something which is proportional to the inverse of the ionization front speed. So here you can see that there is a lot of information, um, and also with this kind of map, we can compare um, different models of uh, simulations. Um, for example, you can see that with this plot, uh, on the y-axis you have, uh, well, the gradient of reionization times, which is the inverse of the ionization from speed, and the normalized reionization re times, and there you have the cosmological uh, simulation map, and there you have the semi-analytical simulation map, and you can see that there is uh, some difference between these two maps. So we, with this map, we can probe uh, the difference between different kind of simulations. Uh, and the measurements that we can do on this map, we can, uh, uh, will show you that we can also compare them to Gaussian random field predictions. Uh, so again, the, the aim of all of that is to study the evolving topology of the reionization process. So firstly, uh, I've said that uh, this map is a simulated map, so uh, can we reconstruct it from observation? So that's what uh, we try to do. We try to depart from this uh, map, uh, this 21 centimeter map, at uh, one particular redshift and reconstruct this um, reionization times map. So we do it with a conventional neural network uh, with another PhD at the Strasbourg Observatory. Uh, so uh, as an input of this network, we put uh, one map at one specific redshift, here it's 11 for example, uh, one map of the 21 centimeter signal, and we reconstruct as an output the reionization times map. Uh, so this uh, network has a unit uh, architecture um, and radius. Uh, to do so, we use a lot of simulations. So as we need a lot of simulation, we use semi-analytical simulations with 21 scan paths, different models of reionization, and uh, we do one prediction per uh, observational redshift. Uh, and to do so, we use uh, 35,000 images. Um, so these are the results. On the left here, you have again the 21CM um, map uh, at the redshift of 11 here. Uh, uh, in the middle panel, you can see the reionization times map from the simulation. And on the right here, you can see the reconstructed map uh, with the neural network. So you can see that this reconstructed map uh, is, uh, gives us well the structures that we have in the simulated map, but it is smooth, so we lose the smaller scales. And what's interesting with the reionization times map is that we can, uh, we can measure the reionization history. So here I'm showing you the reionization history. It's the volume fraction of neutral gas as a function of the time or the redshift. And with this dashed um, line here, you can see the measurements that we do in the simulated map. Um, the dotted line represents the measurements in the prediction, and the red one is for the redshift of 11. So you can see that uh, it really fits what we measure with the true maps, meaning that with uh, this um, 21 centimeter map at a redshift of 11, we can reconstruct all of the reionization history, uh, we can reconstruct the past and extrapolate the future uh, departing from this redshift of 11. Uh, what we also try to do is uh, to add noise to our 21 centimeter map. Um, so we take the noise characteristic uh, from SKA and with this, uh, and, and downgrade the resolution of this uh, map at the redshift of eight to the resolution of SKA. So here is the prediction, and you can see that uh, on the large scales, we still have the same kind of structures as the simulated map, but it is even more smooth than before. And what you can see is that the reionization history is also pretty well reconstructed, meaning that it still uh, seems to work with uh, noisy maps. 
So now that we have seen that we can reconstruct this uh, map of interest from the uh, observations, uh, well, we can try to uh, measure some statistics within it. And first, we wonder uh, how does the relation propagate from the reionization sources. So to answer that, I'm using 21CM fast simulations. Um, so on the left here, you can see the density maps um, from which I, I extracted the, the gas, uh, the matter filaments we dispersed. And here you can see the reionization redshift map from which I extracted with dispersed the reionization, the reionization patches I mentioned before. Uh, so the aim here is to compare the orientation of the matter filaments with the, uh, with the um, reionization patches. So I'm showing you two kinds of uh, patches that we have in our simulations. On both images, you can see with the rainbow colors, the patches, the reionization patches, and with the pink cells, the uh, density filament, the matter filament. So on the left, you can see that the patch is rather aligned with the matter filament. Uh, meaning that the radiation follows the matter filament. And on the right here, you can see that the radiation seems to go perpendicularly with respect to the filament, meaning that uh, the radiation follows the path of his resistance. And with uh, many statistical measurements, we showed that the dominant case in our simulations is these prolate aligned patches with the matter filament. Um, and on the contrary, the underrepresented case is this butterfly patch. Um, which could be the case of isolated or strong emitter that uh, drive the reionization and totally dominate uh, their environment. Um, so now I'm going to show you some uh, results, some measurements uh, on the reionization time that we compare with the Gaussian random field theory. So here we want to uh, characterize the evolution of the reionization process. Uh, so to do so, we use uh, simulations, uh, cosmological simulations. Um, you can see the reionization times here on the top uh, of this uh, plot uh, with different moving. And what we want to do is to measure some statistics within this field and compare them with what we would have with the Gaussian or Lampier theory. So what's interesting with the Gaussian field is that with only the power spectrum, we have uh, all of the information that is present in this, uh, in this map. So uh, we can extract the power spectrum of this, uh, uh, of this uh, simulation and uh, generates this uh, Gaussian random field. So you can see that by eye, um, it's rather difficult to distinguish, to say which one is a simulated map and which one is the uh, Gaussian field. Um, but we will uh, compare the measurement to be sure of that. Uh, yeah, so first, uh, the Gaussian random, uh, random field theory works like that. So you take normalized uh, Gaussian field emit derivative, you compute probability distribution function, and with more or less complicated uh, and purely mathematical uh, calculations, you have access to uh, many analytical predictions. Uh, so if you, uh, measure, if you measure the feeling factor, you have the reionization history I mentioned before. Um, the feeling factor of the gradient of reionization time uh, probe the, the ionization uh, front speed. Um, if you compute the ionization length, well, you follow the evolution of the neutral uh, or ionized bubble size. Um, if you're interested, again, at the uh, reionization uh, sources, you can plot the PDF of the field value at its minima. And uh, lastly, the skeleton length uh, probe the places uh, of percolation of um, the ionization fronts. So I'm going to show you uh, some uh, measurements, uh, not all of them. First, I'm going to start with the um, ISO control length. So here on this part, you can see the ISO controls of the reionization times. Uh, same thing for the Gaussian random field. Um, and here I'm showing you the measurements that we uh, do uh, for the ISO control length within the reionization times map. So with the crosses, there is the, uh, the simulation measurements. So you can see at the beginning of reionization that there is no ionized gas. Uh, when we progress with reionization, the, the, the bubbles uh, are getting uh, bigger and percolate. And uh, at an average time, you, uh, after an average time, you follow the last neutral uh, bubbles that are getting smaller until the end of reionization when there is uh, no more neutral gas. Uh, so on this plot, you can also see the Gaussian random field prediction with these black lines. And you can see that the uh, measurements from the uh, reionization times map are really close to this Gaussian uh, prediction, meaning that the uh, reionization times is nearly a Gaussian field. So why do I say nearly? It's because uh, there is uh, some imprints of non-Gaussianity in our measurements. So if you look again at this uh, measurement, uh, which with on the way axis, the, the, the inverse of the ionization transpeed, 
and on the x-axis, the uh, normalized ionization time. Uh, on, the on the bottom here, you can see the Gaussian uh, measurements, uh, which are symmetric by definition. And on the top, you can see the EMA measurements, and there is an asymmetry for the uh, smallest moving, uh, which is due to the uh, ionization, ionization forms that are getting accelerated uh, until the end of ionization. What you can also see is that this uh, asymmetry disappears when we smooth the, um, the map, meaning that for uh, the resolution that are close to what we will have with SKA, uh, the reionization times is nearly Gaussian, is almost Gaussian. Um, so yeah, this uh, reionization times map are really interested because they have a lot of information within them and we, uh, we have access to a lot of things uh, about the growth of structures, the uh, bubbles, the percolation. And we can reconstruct it from uh, observations, uh, from uh, 21 centimeter observations. And um, as they are nearly Gaussian field, we have uh, directly uh, access uh, analytically to uh, all of these uh, measurements I've showed before. Uh, so in the future, there is a lot of things we want to do again with this map and uh, starting to uh, improve our neural network reconstruction uh, to reconstruct also the small scales. Um, we could also take into account the asymmetries in the uh, Gaussian non field predictions um, and do again the same kind of study with more resolved uh, simulations, for example, with Diablo. Uh, and yeah, thanks for your attention. Thank you for this very nice talk. Uh, we have a few questions. Hi, uh, nice talk. Um, Emma? Not your name, name of a simulation, hmm? Thessan, which is a very big simulation that's come out of MIT and Harvard. Uh, Nick Naden's long history of this, Ilya and Ilyov, et cetera. There's been a long numerical history of trying to do radiative transport. Um, have you done comparisons with them? And, and I want to add one other thing is because you have the initial conditions, can you do 21 centimeter fast on this and show how well it's comparing with the numerical uh, simulations? Uh, so we've tried to do it, but uh, no, for this uh, study, I haven't done it, so I won't, I couldn't tell you. Well, how do you put the gas physics into the, uh, uh, into the uh, Gaussian random field approximation to the, uh, um, uh, so I, I'm, I guess you do it as what? The power spectrum of what is being used? The power spectrum of ionization time? Uh, of X, uh, E. Is that what is being done? The, the, the um, ionization fraction, that is to say, just the number, not the density, the power spectrum. Is it a N electron? Is that power spectrum that was taken? Yeah. Time maps. And she takes the power spectrum of this map. At a given time. Yeah. No. No, she, these she, maps she, she, are. She, she, yeah. These maps are. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I don't get it. We'll stop. Yeah, okay. Thanks, uh, it's a really nice uh, result. I was trying to understand uh, towards the end some of the details may be relevant to Dick's uh, question. So in, in the test of this uh, uh, Gaussian random field um, model, um, you show in one figure comparing the, the bubble size here, this one, that seems to say that the, the, the Gaussian random field uh, assumption works quite well for these maps. On, and then the next one, uh, I'm not entirely sure if this is comparing the same thing, but this is uh, showing the acceleration front of the ionizing bubbles, I guess. And, and now we see the very clear difference between Gaussian random field measurement versus the actual simulation. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate uh, on these points? Why, why kind of the acceleration front, or this acceleration there is, is showed very clear deviation from the Gaussian random field measurement, whereas in previously the, bu the bubble seem to be uh, in perfect agreement with the Gaussian random field. Well, I think that uh, the, the, these non-Gaussianities are not present in all of the statistics that we can measure. 
and uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't I, I don't really know what to say, but I think uh, yeah, the different measurements shows different things, and uh, the non Gaussian energy uh, appear in this one, but yeah, not. In yeah, but Give you an, an outcome which might also deviate from Gaussian. That's my naive expectation, but maybe I'm missing something here. Since we were just talking about all the uncertainty about how the ionizing photons actually get out of galaxies, I'm curious in the simulations that you're using to, to simulate these measurements, like how the photons are escaping, are they coming equally, you know, an equal escape fraction from galaxies of different masses, or are the small galaxies dominating, or large galaxies, or the high star formation surface density regions, and if it was different, how much would it affect, you know, your outcome in the end? Is it sensitive to, to where they're coming from? Uh, yeah, for these studies, we didn't test uh, different models, but um, I think that uh, when uh, the galaxies are bigger, the reionization happens sooner, and maybe we could we could trace some differences with that. But it would have been to do. <laughs> so the model that's in here is it just a constant escape yeah. fraction? Okay. Yeah. So when you when you're projecting down from uh, to this time, I guess you're projecting down from three dimensions to two dimensions, mm -hmm. right? So my question is how much information do you lose by projecting down to two dimensions and how is this related to the observations which are also supposed to be in 3D as you're sweeping through the frequencies? Uh, so I think we lose the, yeah, we lose the 3D aspect of the, the bubbles and so on. But uh, with the, with the Gaussian uh, random field theory, we can also uh, do the predictions for 3D uh, for 3D maps, but we didn't try it. <laughs> um, I understand it's easier to do 2D, but how much do yeah. you use like the uh, uh, Well, I'm not sure <laughs> what to say. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, so I was intrigued by your results on the Gaussianity of the reionization time. Of course, the reionization time is not a direct observable. Um, you showed how you can get that from machine learning from the maps, but I guess I was wondering how Gaussian is the brightness temperature field, and have you looked at the Gaussianity of other things that you can measure from the simulation, for example, the UV background? or? Um, yeah, uh, so for example, the density is highly non-Gaussian. Sure. Uh, there, there are a lot, a lot of non-Gaussian processes uh, during reionization, and we were. I was surprised that uh, these reionization times were Gaussian. So uh, yeah. <laughs> have you have you compared how Gaussian the observable is, which is the brightness temperature? Uh, no, we didn't okay. compare them. Thanks. I mean, maybe I have some of the same question as previous people. I'm trying to get my head around this, the use of this reionization time, because it's a new way of thinking about it, yeah. which I think is interesting. But uh, so, so it, to try to understand it, let, let's imagine that you had the, the SKAs observing in two different redshifts, mm -hmm. and you derive reionization time map from one redshift, but then the other one isn't the same. What, what would you learn about what's wrong with your modeling if, if you had two slices and they give inconsistent reionization time maps. So ideally, the maps should be the same. Yeah. Uh, but um, at different redshifts, you have uh, more or less noise, which will uh, highly impact our results. And I, uh, I showed here the results at uh, redshift of 11, because they, they were the best results we could do with uh, our neural network. But yeah, ideally, they should be the same. But due to noise, we can have some uh, differences. But it's the ideally I'm trying to unpack because there's a, then there's a set of assumptions, which which if the two maps don't agree, one of the assumptions is wrong. So I'm trying to understand what that would what that would be in order to try and understand what the reionization time maps are really telling me. Okay. 
measuring different structures. Yeah. So they'll have different reanalyzation times. Does that you'll, you'll measure one structure at redshift five okay. and another red structure at redshift three, but they should be the same because you're not looking at the same place and seeing redshift. Sure, so there could be a correlation depending on the Yeah, so there might be some yeah, yeah, actually, if I, if I can just comment on that, I, I'm a co collaborator of Emilie on this work. So ju just to, for your last point, actually that's the thing, it's just that uh, with reionization time maps, you have an idea of how, it, uh, how the process goes on uh, on the sky, right? And ideally what you would like to do is to cross-check what you predict on the sky with what you predict along the line of sight and therefore along redshift. So uh, that's, uh, that's just a comment that I wanted to add. But yeah, it makes a lot of sense. That's what you would like to do. Are the predictions that you're doing at any given redshift are consistent with the with the the time the the redshift evolution? Um, uh, so, with uh, time as a Gaussian field, uh, I think you had a plot of a power spectrum of that field. Yeah. Um, can you actually comment uh, on what features does it have uh, and what does it mean? What's, does it have a particular slope or particular scales? Uh, I think that, um, so we didn't do that kind of studies, but I think that the realization times map are uh, really correlated with the matter density. Uh, and I think that you you could trace the same uh, structures with uh, with uh, this kind of map. So it, it there should be some correlation with uh, this power spectrum and the power spectrum of the density. But we didn't uh, analyze it. Any other question? Questions online? No. No. All right. So uh, let's thank Emily again.